Uh, shall we start, Professor? Yeah. yeah. So, good evening to everyone. I welcome you all to the 17th lecture in the lecture series in Nonlinear Dynamics. Unlike the earlier meetings, today we met at 7 p.m. to cope up with Brazilian time, which is 10.30 a.m. in the morning. I am happy to introduce today's speaker, Professor Roberto Andri Krenkel, who was my postdoctoral supervisor. I met and started work, working with him in the late 90s, and still we work together occasionally. Professor Krenkel had also visited Boris Dawson University once and visited few other institutions in Tamil Nadu. In view of our current MSc students, I would like to read out his biodata very briefly. Professor Krenkel is working at Instituto di Fisica Theorica, Sao Paulo, Brazil which is a well-known institute for theoretical physics in Latin America. And students from the entire Latin America come to this institute and complete their postgraduate and doctoral studies. More interestingly, the institute attracts postdoctoral research from all over the world. Even today, you can see many foreign, foreigners carrying out their postdoctoral work in this institute. Professor Krenkel is working on different topics in mathematical biology. To name a few, I spell he works on diffusion in fragmented or limited habitants, modeling infusious disease dynamics, population biology, and water reservoirs. Um, students, if you want to know more about him, please visit his homepage. Since I don't want to take much of his time, now I hand over the session to Professor Krenkel. Over to you, Professor. So, uh Thank you, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to, to give this uh, this lecture. And uh, well, good evening uh, for everyone. That's good. Uh, good morning for me. <laughs> and um, so, let me start sharing my screen with the presentation. Hope this works as it should. It goes. Okay, so um, I hope you are seeing my presentation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So, in this talk, uh, I will talk about uh, modeling in epidemiology. But well, not all the epidemiology, obviously. And then I will focus on, on the more recent works. I've been involved and so on, and uh, in, in the modeling of the COVID-19 pandemic with, uh, with particular uh, data which are taken from, from the Brazilian uh, 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 case. So I plan to have make the talk not very uh, technical, and, and it has basically three uh, three. Um, Part uh, first is a gentle introduction to to what uh, what is uh, modeling uh, ep epidemics in general. Then uh, there comes a discussion about how to use models and how not to use models and what they can give you, which is important for for decision makers and. Uh, and what you should not do with models. And finally, I will give you three examples of studies that uh, from my group uh, connected to modeling COVID-19 and the kind of answers and the kind of questions and answers that we, we have. So, let me start. Okay, just to, to set the, the scenario that this is the number of new cases day by day in the world of COVID-19. Okay? So that's the epidemic curve of COVID-19. And you see that uh, it has many features. And the one feature is that you have waves here. And they are not the same as we know now. We have this big one, Omicron. But uh, these cases are cases that that are uh, uh, 
you have hospitalization, pe people that are hospitalized, and people that are only mild cases, and so on. So it seems to be not a very regular pattern, but well, more or less. Okay? Now, when you go and look at the cases at particular countries, you get something which is completely different. N not completely different in the sense that you still have this wave, but for instance, you, you have here, uh, um, can you, um, oops, sorry, that was wrong. I can't, can you see my, my pointer? No. No, no. No, my pointer. Uh, well, what happened to my point? Just a moment. Yeah. Maybe I have to do this this way. Okay, so when I use the pointer, I will, you're still seeing, yeah? Yeah. Yes. What? Uh, it's not in the full uh, full screen because the pointer disappears in the full screen. But, but uh, okay, so if you look here, for instance, this is Cheshire in, the, in Europe, you see that the, the case has almost disappeared at a certain point. There was anything, there was anything. And then you get this double at the end, double wave, a wave and another wave. If you, you look here in, in, in UK, it's, it's, it's very different because after almost disappearing, you have a sometimes like, like a lot of cases for a lot of time. And then you have an explosion. Yeah. And if you like uh, look, India, that's that's uh, that's a more common pattern with, with waves. If you like, it's completely different again because you you see that you have this wave which corresponds usually to some some variants, but the number of cases stays high all the time. Then only decreases in the second semester of two, uh, of 2021. And now it's exploding again because of Omicron. So they're very different patterns. And, and what drives these patterns are processes that are very difficult to model. For instance, and sometimes you have this, this, this kind of waves that, that, that you have increasing number of cases and the number of cases de decreases drastically. But why is it decreasing? Many times it is because uh, government uh, of place has decided that uh, you need a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a lockdown, okay? and, uh, and and well, then it will be a, a challenge to how how you will put a lockdown in your models. Okay? But this is, is is far from obvious, okay? because you you can also not predict what the government and the people will do in face of an epidemic. Okay? So there are many, many different processes which are like very far apart from what we use normally as, as epidemic models in textbooks, which are models that are like the ones I will show you in a minute, but there are mo these are models that, that uh, that are like a like in in in, in, in statistical mechanics, a perfect guess. <laughs> yeah, everybody well mixed populations and so on and so on. So we will see that in order to uh, to make a uh, contribute to to the understanding of the epidemic from a mathematical point of view, with a quantitative point of view, we will have to go beyond the uh, the simple model. Okay, so here is the epidemic model in 101, okay? So I'm assuming that many have heard about this because, uh, because of COVID, everybody hears about models and so on. But the idea is you take the population of the place you are interested. Yeah? Most of the time, this will be either country or city, state, yeah? and you you give uh, uh, you divide the population into classes classes which which refer to the state of an individual in respect to the disease you are modeling I, I will be talking about covid here so but could be other 
is needed to solve. Yeah? So the most simple thing is you have people that are susceptible to, to, to be infected and, 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 and become infectious. Then there are people that are currently infected and can infect other, people's, other people, and then they recover. In this simple model, there's no, no, no death, for instance, in the SIR model, and, and the recovery is forever. Okay? Immunity does not decay. You can obviously modify this and so on, but let's look at it. This is the simplest one. And you, you translate this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of um, um, diagram here into equations with the following uh, 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 in the following way, okay, you, you will have an equation for each of the compartments, for the number of, of individuals in each compartment, or the proportion, if you want, the proportion of people in that uh, compartment. You will have one equation for each compartment. And, and then you say, well, the susceptibles in this model, in this simple model, they can only number can only decay, they can get infected, and uh, there's no way of somebody becoming susceptible again, okay? And, uh, and you are also considering that uh, the time scale you are modeling this, uh, this uh, situation, this is a time scale where there is no demographic change, the population is constant. So you say, well, the number of susceptibles will decay proportionally to the number of susceptibles times the number of infected with a proportionality constant, which is this beta. Okay? So th this is what people use also that can, comes from kindness in the mass action uh, uh, term. Okay? So this is valid uh, if, uh, strictly speaking, if the population as well makes it every individual could um, uh, uh, get in touch can, uh, with any other individual in the population. You know that's not true. There's a network of relations, but for the simple model, this is uh, is what uh, what we assume. Okay? So the number of in, of infected individuals will will increase due to the, the, the individuals coming from the susceptible class, but as the the the, um, um, and the infection has a finite time, people will get uh, recovered, they will also decay. And it's a decay, it's like, uh, like a typical decay term, exponential decay term of, of individuals, and then have this, this proportionality constant, gamma, which has the dimensions of one over time, and one over gamma is the typical duration of the infection. So for most of cases, like, uh, um, like COVID or, or flu, or this is typically five days, 10 days, and so on. Couldn't be very different. AIDS, for instance, it's, 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 it's years. And then, well, all people that go from the class of infected, they will go out of the class and become removed, removed in the sense that they, they have, have no longer the disease and uh, and they are immune. So this is the the simplest model that people consider uh, to discuss epidemics. Okay? And uh, well, it's not solvable, uh, analytical solvable. It's a, as you see, there are the term S times I is nonlinear term. And but the, the solutions are are uh, plotted here. Yeah. Uh, you see, the, the curve of susceptibles always goes down, the curve of recovered can only increase, and the curve of infected increases and decreases. Okay? So, this is the basic. So, let us discuss the, what I will call the glory and miseries of simple models. So the first thing is, they give you an insight into the general behavior of what you would expect if you have an epidemic in a given population. So for instance, here, 
if you go back, you just see this one here, and okay? you see that uh, you have the population which uh, starts, and we have considered the case where at the at time zero, you have all the susceptibles, and you have one individual that's infected introduces in the population, and then you, you, you look at how the dynamics will evolve. At the end, what you see, and if you look here at the, the right side, yeah, at first you that the epidemic increases and decreases. And this is, here we are not considering any intervention. This is a, it's, it's a kind of, uh, of, of uh, very simple model without interventions that make the number of cases go down. So it naturally has an, uh, 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 an increase and then it decreases naturally. So this is, is okay because most of the time epidemics are, are kind of waves. Okay? But not, not always. We will have epidemics that will increase, decrease, and won't go to zero. It's called an endemic state, but this endemic state is not in this model. But one uh, uh, interesting thing is when you look at the end, at the end of the epidemic here, the time, the number of susceptibles is not zero. Therefore, there are remaining susceptibles in the population. It means that not all the population got infected and the epidemic ends and there are still some susceptibles. Or if you want, you can look at the curve of the recovered and the recovered uh, at the end are all people that had the infection, therefore at the, uh, at the end of the epidemic, the number of recovered uh, uh, individuals is the total, what we call the total size of the epidemic. So, from this simple model, you can already have this kind of concept, and you can introduce what people call the R, R, R0, R0, which is beta over gamma, and if you look uh, at these equations, it's... Uh, uh, at the moment, at the time, t equal to zero, you assume that everybody is, in, uh, is, is susceptible, and then you want to know the conditions for the number of, infect of infectious people to increase, and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and these conditions are zero, uh, uh, bigger than one. And okay? it's, it's uh, smaller than one, then, then the number of infected people can only decrease, and if you are considering the, the initial moment, the number of infected people is like one, two, and so the, if R0 is smaller than one, there will be no epidemic. And if it's larger than one, there will be an epidemic. So that's the first thing then. Now, you can, uh, you can give an interpretation, a more biological interpretation of uh, R R zero because uh, one mathematical interpretation is the condition of stability for the uh, for the for the for the state of uh, everybody susceptible. Okay, so are are, are not uh, bigger than one is, is the condition for the state of susceptibles would be unstable, but uh, it can also be seen as in a more biological way, which is the R0 can be interpreted that the number of secondary cases originated by a, a single infector. So how, how many case, how would you expect, um, how would you estimate number of, of persons that uh, one infector, one, one person that is infected, how many people he will infect? So this will de depend on how long he is infectious. And as I told you, one over gamma is the typical duration. Okay, so you should then take in order to know the number of people that that um, that the one person uh, will, in, in on average, in fact, is the time the person stays infective times the number of contacts the person has during this infective uh, phase times the probability the contact is susceptible. And the probability that 
susceptible meeting an infected uh, person will actually generate uh, a new uh, infected person probability of contagion. So one over gamma is this time of infectivity, and the beta is uh, is is kind of saying all of these things here together. Okay. Well, so that's a that's a concept that has been used uh, widely in, 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 in many epidemic models and many different epidemic models. So, okay, and then uh, we also see that uh, you can also calculate the uh, total size of the epidemic and show that it depends on, on R0, and here's the total size of the epidemic in terms of R0, and you see that uh, the total size of epidemic is, is, is uh, not necessarily uh, equal to total population, okay? The, the epidemic naturally dies out before, uh, before infecting everybody. So this, this comes from this. Uh, so the misery is, uh, about this is uh, uh, usually this kind of simple model cannot guide public policies. And, and, um, and, and it, well, I'm referring to COVID in this case, okay? Yeah. These cases, this model, like an SIR model, in this simple model, cannot be fitted to any data because you don't know the number of susceptibles, you don't know the number of recovered people, you don't, you know, don't know the number of people that are actively uh, infected. Because, because all of this, there are asymptomatic cases, you will never know if the person has recovered or if he is still susceptible and so on, so you cannot fit this simple model, the three equations, you cannot fit this to any data. So that, that's the first thing, okay? Uh, mm. uh, what we know usually, best data, is usually hospitalization and death. But this, this, this model does not have hospitalized people. It does not have that, uh, people that disease it. So you will have to make Different models which will incorporate all new classes of infected, asymptom um, hospitalized, asymptomatic, uh, death, and so on. So I have to go beyond. And then there is something very important that heterogeneity in the population. For instance, with COVID, everybody has learned that the, 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 the severity of the disease is very different depending on your age. So there is no ages in this model. So you have to build models where ages are actually taken into account. And so you have to age structure all classes. You have to say this class susceptible has, has, has classes of ages. How many classes? Depends on your data, how, how your data is structured. But you could have simply three classes like uh, from 0 to 20, 20 to to 60, 60, older than 60, or you could have in five and five years, it depends. Okay? So you have to get this structure. So we see, the simple model makes us understand se several things about what is R0, total size epidemic, and so on, that can be constructed from the very simple model. But if you now want to have some importance and to guide public uh, policies with models, you have to have models that have other variables, and then your model will increase enormously in size. So let me give you an example. This is a model we have been working with, this, uh, called the COMO model, COMO is Consortium of Modelers, which is, is uh, it's a group uh, based in Oxford, which we collaborate with them, and we have made a, a version that is particularly suited for the Brazilian uh, data, because the model has to fit to data, and this depends on the country. Some countries have different data from others and so on. Okay? And you see, it has a lot of things. They have the, uh, the uninfected, which are the susceptible, then you have the people that are incubating, then you have the people that are infected but have no symptoms. They have the infected, which have mild symptoms. And then you have the effects infected that get hospitalized. Okay? And in this, in this case, here we are considered that if you are, have no symptoms or mild symptoms, you will get uh, immune after some time, so you get, get uh, 
uh, you will be no longer um, um, sick. But if you are uh, uh, hospitalized, then many things can happen. Okay, so you can have to um, you can, if you go to the hospital. Maybe you can go to a normal bed, or maybe you need an ICU. And this will make difference because the, the, the chances you die are very different if you're in an ICU or if you are just in a, in a normal, uh, normal uh, hospital bed. Okay? But then there's also the chance you need the ICU, but you don't get the ICU, which will increase also the probability of, you, of uh, the person dying. Because, because this is relevant if you are modeling things in a country where ICU beds are, are not sufficient. So they have the maximum capacity. Therefore, you have to put this in the model because your your one wants to model the probable number of people that die from, from the disease. This will depend of if the people that have severe disease get treated or what kind of treatment they can get and the capacity of the public health uh, service. So all of this has to go into this. this this model. So this is this is one model, and each class here is is age structured. So this is like if you have divided each of these uh, small boxes in in class ages. So the for some work we have to use twenty class ages, and. Um, 18 or 19, from, five, from 0 to 5, 5 to 10, and so on, uh, years old. And in other works, we have used less. So that, that's kind of model that is used by, by modelers that actually do advise, like this common model people and so on. They do advise the, the uh, government of the uh, UK and so on. So this is the kind of model that you, that's minimal kind of wanted to be taken seriously as, as, uh, and as, 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 as something that has to do with the reality and can answer things that are important for the, for the public health. And I, I will give you examples of what kind of things are important. So just to have a, I, I, want, I don't want you, uh, just to impress you with a lot of equations, obviously, and, and, uh, but uh, the kind of, of, of way of writing these equations is not, not very different from the from the, the this simple one. It's the kind of of, uh, of flows between compartments. But now you have a lot of compartments. Okay, so I, I won't explain these equations anymore. So okay, so this is more or less to give you an idea of the the world of models. How models are? <coughs> how do you build models? And how are the models that people um, that, that do modeling for for public health guidance. How people will, what kind of model will be used? Okay. There are still other models with which are stochastic and so on. But I don't want to go into this, but you have to have a lot of compartments and be very specific, and your model has to be adapted to the data. Okay. So now, what, what? Are the models used for, and what are they not be used? So about the good use of models, there is here one thing. As physicists or mathematicians, we are usually acquainted with things like in physics, and you make predictions, and then you test theories, and so on. This is a complex system. It's a really complex system because it's it's a, it's it's a system of, of of a problem. It has a biology, the biology of of the infections, but this is also a, pro a problem about society. So you have to take many things into account. For instance, if if you the number of infections increases, maybe people will stay at home naturally, and you have to put this also in mind. So the the point is that they rarely are predictive, predictable, uh, predictive beyond some weeks. So why? First, there are lots of parameters in these models, okay? Because you have the, all the fluxes between the flows between these compartments and the 
there are parameters for each of, of uh, each term in, on those equations, and you have a bunch of equations, and you have a lot of age classes and so on. You have parameters that some of them can be estimated, but sometimes they are just poorly estimated. They have uh, uh, an error, associated error bar, which is very large, a lot, but maybe it's just, just unknown. Okay? So this is a problem. So if, if you want to uh, uh, make a really prediction, I want to make prediction for six months, it's not, that is not, that's not the, the game you're playing. This is, this, that won't work. Okay? That's not, not the way to use model. So, so other things, it's, it's very difficult to model the behavior of people. How will they react? Say you, you consider a scenario where, where people are, uh, um, the government decides that people have to use masks, and then you put this into the model. How do you put this into the model? It's the probability of, 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 uh, of infection when, uh, when people meet, meet, if they are using masks, you, you have a, a, a smaller probability of infection. It's a way of, of modeling the use of masks, but will people obey? So the, to what extent will people obey? Will they use the correct masks and so on? It, that's, it's not possible to know. And, and this is important if you are modeling, and, and, and that's the precise thing here, you are modeling for, for an ongoing epidemic. It's different to model things that happened in the past where you make more academic questions. Here I'm doing models that try to look what, what is happening now and say what will happen in the near future. But this is different, difficult. Yeah? Uh, then there's a not, another problem. You, if you're doing this out, uh, outbreak modeling like COVID-19, you need almost real-time data. If, if I want to predict something that will happen in one week or two weeks, I don't have to know this data now. But the state now is not known. Why? Because cases have to be uh, 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 go through a process of notification. Yeah? And it takes time from the point, from the day the person has the first symptom it, until this person appears in, in a data set saying that there was one person here. It takes time. Depends on the on on your on your notification systems, which varies from country to country. In in rich countries like Sweden or Denmark, small and rich, there is no delay. But in countries like Brazil, it can take ten or fifteen days for for a case to be notified, be registered on the on the data set. So. You never, you don't know what's happening now. And that's, I mean, you want to project in the future, but you only know what happened two weeks ago. So this is, it, this will increase the uncertainties. Yeah? So at the end, all of these problems with, with your data and modeling a, a complex system where not all variables are known will increase your the answer changes, and then this is intrinsic. Therefore, well, uh, normally answer changes grow with time. So for the, it's like weather prediction. You can do it for ten days, but then uh, you know it's 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 different. You you won't get uh, uh, good results beyond this, and that's more or less the same thing. And not the same thing, but answer changes are, are growing, and and so models are not meant to be predictive beyond the, the short term. But, okay, if they are not predictive in the sense of ongoing epidemics, um, they can give orders of magnitude of what can be expected. For instance, you can say, I, I have a worst case scenario. Okay? And uh, how, how many persons will I, um, do we expect to die or to do you expect to be infected? The orders of magnitude. This is this is something which is less dependent on the on the precise details of the parameters and so on. Yeah. So that models will also allow to build scenarios of different interventions. What do I mean by that? 
you have a model like the one I, I showed you, the, the Como model. Okay? Then you say, okay, uh, what will be, I will model the effect of, of lockdowns or of use of a mask. But lockdowns can be complete lockdown, can be less uh, strict uh, lockdowns. There can be a school, can be open or closed. Okay. So you can imagine several possibilities. And then you want to compare the possibilities. Um, and, and this comparison between uh, uh, possibilities, even if it's not predictive, can give you some, some idea of what are the best interventions. So for instance, we have done something like this. Um, Okay, okay, now this is not, this is here. So, for instance, this is the kind of thing you have. You have an epidemic and, and uh, then you have scenarios where you don't do anything. For instance, that it would be this curve here. Then you have interventions that, uh, that flatten the curve, but then you release the interventions and get higher uh, uh, waves. And you can have, have uh, uh, lower cases. So, each of these curves corresponds to a given scenario. I'm, I'm not saying which ones because they're complicated and they're context dependent on, on, the, on the particular population you are modeling. This is made for some work with, about the city of Sao Paulo. I, I, I won't go into the details of what exactly the interventions are. But then this kind of thing, non-pharmaceutical non interventions, masks, or many other things. Okay? So this is the kind of thing which we call a scenario. Yeah? So, they can give you this relative importance. Also, fitting models to data without thinking I want to predict anything may give you an estimate of the parameters that you don't know. Okay? What are the parameters that best fit the data? And maybe these parameters are important. I will show you an example of that. And models are also essential if to, to, for your vaccination uh, um, rollout. How is the best way to vaccinate the population? Which, which uh, uh, age classes should we begin? What's the best uh, uh, time between uh, doses? Uh, uh, what's the effect of uh, a booster and so on? Usually you have data uh, that can give you parameters about vaccines because these are data that people from epidemiology study, but they are cohorts, but they are um, uh, trials and so on. So that there are, with respect to vaccines, there are a lot of data. And this, you can use this in order to, uh, to, uh, to have a, a design of uh, how is the best way to vaccinate your population. So, just a minute. I will give you three brief examples of what we have done in the next, next 10 minutes, just to have a feeling of, 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 of the, let's say, the real world uh, uh, modeling that can, uh, can be used, uh, can be useful, not only to publish papers, but also actually to, to, to public policies. So one of the models that we have used and studied is the effect of reopening the schools. Uh, you have a situation, which in many countries happened, that you, um, that you closed everything, if schools were closed, and then you want to know, okay, how what, what happens if I, I reopen schools? How will this appear in the model? The model has age. Okay? So we have, in your model, there are age classes, and there are contact rates between age classes. Okay? So the contact rate within in age classes of people, for, say, from, from the ages 5 to 10, and uh, with people from the age of, uh, I don't know, 25 to 30, and their contact rates, and these contact rates will depend on if, pe if people are going or not to the schools. So you can model the, the reopening of the schools, but you start with no school, the, the, your data in the past 
is, is considering schools are closed. What will happen is, is that the contact rates between uh, uh, children or, or young adults will change, right? And this will have an impact on the transmission. Right? So the kind of model that we used is, uh, is, is more or less the same as this Como model, uh, susceptible, exposed, and you have people that uh, are asymptomatic, uh, people that are infectious and circulate in the population, and then you have people that are infectious but they self-isolate, which is important because they don't transmit. So this is regulated by by public health uh, uh, officer. What are the laws of the place? Okay? So and then you have all this hospitalized the people that uh, are uh, normal bed, ICU bed, ICU people that need ICU beds but don't get them, and so on, and so on. And all each class has been divided into age classes. Okay? So what we calculated is uh, is things like we are taking three cities in Brazil, which we had data, uh, about the number of people uh, hospitalized. The fitting of the model is done using hospitalized persons. Okay? And here, what, what you... Uh, maybe, let me, maybe it's easier to see like this. Yeah? What, what you calculate is the excess... Uh, uh, cumulative excess of infections or of pe people dying. Okay, so uh, you see uh, there are several colors here, but uh, this is uh, young adults and, and and older people. But one thing that you clearly see, and the best way to look at this is maybe here in this city called Porto Alegre, that this is the 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 the, the cumulative deaths in the population due to reopening. So the excess of people that will die because you are having more contacts in the case of this reopening of the schools, it's not needed. So you can, in this case, you could safely open uh, a school to 25% of the, of the of, for 25% for of, uh, 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 of, um, of students in a class. So if you have normally, say, uh, uh, 40, if you go up to more or less 10, which is 25%, you don't have almost no effect. But then they have a very strong increase if you open too much. Therefore, the insight you get is there is a safe, more or less safe, uh, uh, opening up, up to a certain percentage of the contacts that people would have normally in a school. Above this, you have a strong increase of number of cases and proportionally the number of people that will die. Okay? And this is one with this kind of models. With, uh, okay? So, second word I want to give you an idea is, is calculating the transmissibility and reinfection properties of, of a new variant. So what you are seeing here is the, uh, the weekly hospitalization uh, cases of due to COVID-19 in a city called Manaus, which is in the middle of the state of Amazonas in the north of Brazil, which is a place which is it's, it's, it's a big city. It has, I think, has two, two or three million uh, 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 people, but uh, it's 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 far apart from the rest because it's in the middle of the jungle. So. What you see here is, is, is a first wave, which is the wild type, is the beginning, which was very, very uh, uh, strong in the city, Mount Manaus. Then they get through this, but here, uh, I, I cut the dates here, but this is the beginning of 2021 here, this place. You have an explosion of cases, a super explosion, then it goes down now. And, I keep, and here at the, at the end, it's again Omicron, but I, I'm, we are focusing on this one. This happened because this new variant appeared in this region, which is, uh, let's call it later, the gamma variant, and it's a big explosion. Now, what we need is, oh, 
Okay. Is a word that has already been published now. It's, it's a model which uh, considers two variants, the wild type and the variant of concern, the gamma variant. And this model is age structured, but only three class ages. And uh, it's, it's simpler than the previous one. We have hospitalized infectious and uh, uh, asymptomatic. You don't have all the, 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 the structure you have in the other models. And you can have reinfection. Here you have, and uh, where I'm pointing, is that the people that got um, recovered due to the wild type, the, the resident type, and then you have the gamma variant invading. And these people here can get reinfection to a, to a certain point. And the data that you have is just the number of cases, hospitalized cases, and the number of, uh, the proportion of the, uh, of the gamma variant in the population. It's, it starts at zero and then goes almost to one after two months, two or three months. Okay? And then these are the fits that we have done with this model. We have fitted this curve and we have made the best fit possible fit. We have used likelihood things and, and, and statistics and so on, which is non-trivial, non but uh, it's not important for us now. And, and with this fit, we, we can discover what's the relative transmissibility of the gamma variant. So what we, we got is it's 2.6 times more um, um, more transmissible, more infective, if you want, and than the resident one, which was the wild. And so this is what really called attention in the world because 2.6 is very, very transmissible. So, and knowing this, which affects your R0, affects all the dynamic, having a higher transmissibility, we could, we could use these results to, to, to call out people and say, okay, we have a real problem. If you look at this data, they imply very high transmissibility and, uh, and also the possibility of reinfections. Actually, we also, um, oh no, I, I didn't. Okay, I, I didn't write here that uh, we also calculated the amount of people uh, between November 2020 and end of January 2021, which is the time of this big explosion of cases in Manaus. We um, we calculated that 28 percent of the cases were reinfections, and so there was already the possibility of the variant reinfecting people that had been infected previously. And, and uh, to our, I mean, to, to our uh, happiness, uh, months or two later, actually people that do field work with, uh, with calculated the amount of reinfected persons that actually matched our results. So that, that gives us also some more confidence that we predicted something that actually was then confirmed later. So my last example is assessing the optimal time between doses. If you have two dose uh, vaccines like uh, AstraZeneca, BioNTech Pfizer, or what we use in Brazil is also CoronaVac and so on, uh, you, have the, you have the possibility to have, you have this following problem. If you can you can can give the first dose and then wait say three weeks for the second dose, but you could also wait longer. And the difference usually is you get a better protection if you wait longer. But on the other hand, if you wait three months, for instance, but in, instead of waiting one month, but on the other hand, this will take you more time, and people will with the first dose are not completely protected. So what is the best optimal time between the vaccines, between the doses, so to, to minimize the number of people that will get infected and consequently will die? Okay? So this is what we call optimal time between vaccines. And, and we have used a model which is susceptible. Uh, uh, that you have three, three uh, 
repeated uh, 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 blocks here, which is for susceptibles, susceptibles with first dose and susceptible with second dose, and then you have all the all the epidemic uh, structure uh, uh, later. And then what you you look at is uh, you use the parameters that the vaccine developers have studied and published uh, of effectivity of the first dose only, of the effectivity of the second dose, if given uh, with uh, three or four uh, weeks, or if given with 12 weeks and so on, and then we could calculate what would be the best st strategy, and the strategy depends on, uh, on the relative efficacy of first dose, because if the first dose is 100% protective, you don't you can can wait forever <laughs> and give to give the second dose because uh, 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 people are already protected. But if the first dose gives you no protection, then you typically need to vaccinate as 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 soon as possible with the second dose, say um, at uh, at the three weeks uh, interval, because the people are are are, are as, are still practically susceptible. Okay? So they get this here. You have to, this is a heat map, but the number of weeks here is the weeks, which are the optimal, optimal uh, 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 interval between doses to, um, uh, for the three vaccines. It's CoronaVac, AstraZeneca, and BioNTech, Pfizer. Okay? And so you see that uh, there's some, some curiosity here, but the, in, in the general view is, is you have a threshold here, more or less in the middle. If if uh, if the first dose is, is sufficiently effective, that's at least uh, fifty percent of the protection. Then you can wait three months. If it's not effective, then better not. Okay? And this is different from vaccine to vaccine. So, for instance, with Corona back, the, 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 you you should not wait too long because Corona back has has a small, very small efficacy. Uh, in, uh, with only one dose, whereas you can uh, safely uh, extend the interval between doses for Pfizer BioNTech because the first dose is already very protective, and you can extend the time between doses, and then this is the optimal way of vaccinating the population. Well, and okay, let's do it. So, things that. You should pay attention if you're going to do modeling an epidemic and an outbreak of epidemics. First, know your data. You have, if you go, a lot of people that are newcomers to the subject, and you go and, and look at some site, some website, like uh, all of world and data and world dometers and so on, there are a lot of, of course, a number of cases. Well, you have to know what the, you have the number of cases per day or per week. But what is this day? Is this the day of notification? Is it the day of first symptoms? Or is it the day of hospitalization? Or is it the day of death? What, what, what day is associated to a case? And this is important because notification dates, which is very common, are not good. Because notification dates depend on the administrative system of notification. It has nothing to do with the pandemic. You should refer your data to, to the day of first symptoms or day of hospitalization or something like that, which are relevant dates. So you have to know what your data mean, actually, how they are collected, how precise they are. You should also consider the, carefully the special scale of your model. We don't work with models for Brazil. Brazil is so heterogeneous that you can have an epidemic going on in, in I don't know, in Manaus, as we had, and nothing happening in, in the other part of the country. So if you aggregate everything in, about Brazil, you are not being uh, uh, very informative for people that have to decide something. Maybe the, the, the a certain municipality it's better not to do anything because they don't have any cases. But if, if you, all your data is always aggregated for the whole country, these people will have no information. So you have to be careful. You have to carefully consider what's the, the good scale, special scale, where to aggregate your data. You should always estimate confidence interval, performance sensibility analysis, 
sometimes the, the, the confidence interval is very large. This is important for people that will take decisions. You have to gather as much as possible information about the parameters. You have to perform real serious bi bibliographical reviews in order to get the parameters as much as you can. And don't over evaluate your, your, your findings. Okay? You should always phrase your results in terms of scenarios and possibilities and not saying all oh, the epidemic will be over in two months. Okay? You know, people have done this and it was completely wrong. Well, why? Was the, the, the model very bad? No, not very bad, but the model didn't take into account variants or didn't take into account how people behave. And there are lots of things that happen in the world that cannot be taken into account for models. So this is a limitation. So you don't over-evaluate and say, I, I can predict exactly what will happen. Okay. And final thing, work in collaboration with epidemiologists. Epidemiologists know a lot of things, even if they don't know, don't, don't know the math. They do, they do know the statistics, and they know, know what is important and what is the real meaning of the data. So all of these works have been discussed some of them are in, in collaboration with co-authors, being epidemiologists. Others have been discussed with epidemiologists that uh, really, really give you a very strong input so that you can do something which is actually relevant. Okay. So that's it. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, this is my email. Uh, this work has been performed in the, well, I'm, I'm a professor at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, but also there's this uh, Brazilian COVID-19 observatory, which which is uh, connected to our group and a bunch of people and there are medical doctors and there are physicists, there are biologists and uh, computer scientists and, and uh, many of these results are obtained in, in, in the context of this group. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Now, the session is open for questions or clarifications. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Kranekel, for a very nice uh, presentation of this uh, of your work. So I have some questions. What is the view of medical people on these modelings? So depends, because there. You no, know, first. You have, if you say medical doctors, well, there are medical doctors that, have, that know science, and there are medical doctors that, that are just, I mean, clinicians, and, and they don't understand how science works. So this is very different people. Right? If, if it's, a, it's, it's a medical doctor or people in medicine, which is also a researcher and so on, they will most easily see the value of, of the contribution from them, coming from the models, even if they don't understand the mathematics. They don't understand what that this has value for them, and and um, and if they are working with public health and so on, they would be more acquainted. To models are used by many groups in the world and so on. They know this even if they are not models. Now, medical doctor, the guy that you will visit if you are sick, maybe he has no idea of what it is. Okay, he's a specialist. I don't know on, on, on some on some particular disease, and it's not because he is a a doctor that he actually knows something about public health, epidemiology, or mathematics. So uh, these are very different things. Then many, many people from, from medicine are, are in positions that are important uh, 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 at the level of municipalities or state governments or uh, federal government, and at, at, uh, at intermediate, uh, uh, not political posts, but uh, positions, but intermediate technical positions, and then there's also this uh, variety of people. There's, uh, if people are more connected to clinical medicine and so on, they they will not not value so much the things, but if people are connected to public health, epidemiology, and uh, this kind of thing, they know that models are important. I mean, that's what happens as in yeah. Brazil. And, and uh, this can also be very different, different from one country to the other. Yeah, but but the medical people are, are the people who really deal with uh, with the patients. 
and when you make predictions from different models very often the models go uh, uh, in uh, away from the actual situations so so they will always have uh, have some doubts on these modelings okay so yeah yeah uh, 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 yeah 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 but coming for the uh, present uh, third wave of omicron so there is a real problem with data because um, because now uh, many people uh, i mean they many people do not take it seriously and they do self medication or even even medical people suggest uh, don't come to the um, hospital take simple simple medication and so on so how do we go from the uh, from here so whether i mean to predict whether uh, this uh, this epidemic will die down or it will not recur at least uh, after some time and so yeah. on yeah so omicron, omicron is very difficult very difficult yeah so uh, you you never will never know the number of cases because yes. some people get mild symptoms you say okay well, i i will wait at home if i get uh, worse than i go to the doctor but most of the time people just get gets okay in some days so this will never appear in any data yeah. Set, yeah. yeah but what well what are the data sets that most people use when they have models and want to fit things is hospitalization your hospitalization in many countries in brazil in particular but uh, other countries also is 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 uh, is of mandatory notification so if you get to the hospital and you have covid it have tested covid and then this will appear in the data the problem with omicron is that that uh, 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 that the, the in, what we call the infection hospitalization rate is very different because it's it's much, much smaller than for the previous thing so we can do say some uh, some work as long as we are looking at some hospitalization and death because this is you can trust better but talking about total number of cases is almost impossible for us yeah particularly in the present wave okay yeah. thank you very much thank you what um professor are you able to read the chat box there is a question in the chat box ah uh, uh, let me see okay okay uh, Uh, sure. So it's always possible to do such a uh, such model, but the point is. You have to take really care with the with time dependent parameters because you could fit your your model to the past almost exactly if you take a parameter that usually has a value and you make it time dependent because this is effectively you say every week you have a different value for this parameter yet in actually this parameter is not fifty two parameters. It's just, Number of weeks of the of the year, so oh, this is overfitting, which means you 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 get the good fit, but you don't get any prediction. So have to take care with time dependent parameters. That's a kind of message that uh, sometimes the parameters actually vary. But if you are fitting a parameter. For instance, the probability of contagions. If you are fitting, you you should not fit every week with a different number because this is uh, it will be a uh, overfitting. Uh, there is one more question, I think. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, is it related? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 just uh, yeah, it's 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 just a uh, continuation of the first. I think I I I think I have already answered. Yeah. So, 
questions any other questions from student side uh, uh, sir excuse me sir uh, am i audible sir yes yes uh, you can go uh, uh, yes actually i was asking that uh, like uh, i am audible sir yes yes prashant Uh, yes sir yes sir actually i am asking that uh, if we know that uh, some like uh, uh, conditions of the particular system or country like uh, those conditions we can con consider as the m pro parameters and uh, based on those parameters only we are going to uh, like uh, like uh, like we are going to apply the like various possible ways uh, which will reduce the pandemic rate Uh, so like what are the n parameters uh, we are applying those are uh, uh, obviously they are motivated by the m parameters uh, so i think from those m parameters uh, we are will be able to uh, maybe quantify that uh, uh, in what way that uh, uh, the starting one n parameters will vary with respect to time so uh, yeah uh, so uh, Yeah. So, but, okay. But the, the point is, is uh, there, there's a real difficulty to know which are the relevant parameters sometimes. Okay. Because this depends on 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 things that sometimes are not measured, and uh, so. Okay. Uh, was I able to uh, explain, sir, the question? Uh, I don't know if. Uh, I could explain. No, no, I, I, uh, okay, maybe you explain it again. But uh, uh, oh, you say you have parameters like you you mentioned here in, in Britain, like. Uh, okay, uh, so, uh, actually, I need one, to think. There's a number of parameters for a country, and No, I don't get exactly what you want to do. Actually, you 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 want to model the epidemic at a at a at a, at the level of a country, yes? Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. and and you have parameters that characterize the country. Uh, yes, sir. The conditions of the country, like we have uh, two series of the uh, parameters. Like one is uh, which is uh, uh, because of which uh, the rate is going to reduce, and uh, one is because of which the rate is uh, going to increase, and both uh, those n and m are uh, dependent on each other. So, uh, n is yeah. uh, somehow is motivated by m parameters. Good. So, yes, I know things like this, but um, which are done for counties or for sometimes for cities, by we got. You have different social structures and so on, different parameters. Usually, people don't use models for this. This kind of models, they do a statistical analysis on on the relation between these parameters. But this is this is just, but this made with statistics. It's more like uh, Bayesian statistics, a statistical approach to to compare. Uh, uh, Causality uh, measurements between different parameters. So, uh, so my answer is that this this is usually approached not with this kind of model. It's it's approached with statistical. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. I think I need to think more about it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So, any other questions? uh so i'm not getting any questions <laughs> so mm -hmm. i th i want to thank you professor uh, for thank you for accepting our invitation and delivering a wonderful lecture on modeling covid and uh, explaining the intricacies in <laughs> modeling covid 19 thank you so um well uh, i thank you for the invitation and thank you for for yeah for, for attending the seminar yeah <laughs> At least I have. We are able to meet each other. Yeah. 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 Okay. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Goodbye. Yeah. Good night. Okay. Good night. Thank you, Prof. Thank you.